This is the Tribe Mastermind, where we talk business, purpose, and passion with your hosts, Jordan Muela and Steve Welty. If you're ready to shift into a bigger future, then this is the show for you. So plug in, buckle up, and get ready to be. What's up, Jordan? My brother, how are you living? I heard you were a little under the weather. You, you come back stronger than ever? Yeah, man. I got hit surprisingly in summer, which is odd. Uh, <laughs> but my wife, uh, she teaches preschool. And she hasn't went back to work since Miles was born. But she went back for two days. Once was like a month ago. And then she got sick and Miles got sick. And then once was the day before yesterday. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then I got hit and Miles got hit. So she's like, I don't think I'm going to go back to work. Like, I don't, it's taking the family now. <laughs> and I'm like, whatever you want to do, babe. But, uh, but yeah, it was interesting. I, I, I hate to like throw a positive spin on everything, but <laughs> it was kind of nice actually sitting in bed. Like things just slowed down. I didn't even have the TV on for most of it or anything. I was mm. like staring at the ceiling. Like, you know, like it, when you're, so incapacitated that you just you're like I couldn't do anything if I really wanted to. I had like a mm-hmm. super high fever. I was like, it was hot outside, and I was like freezing under the covers. <laughs> it was just things slowed down, so it was kind of nice actually. I just got present. So nice, yeah. I used to get super depressed about getting sick because I'm thinking about all this time that I'm losing. But if you can actually just use it to actually unwind and create some mental space, I could see some upside there. Yeah. Yeah. So I just relaxed and, uh, hung out with the kids and, um, got, Hey, diddle, diddle stuck in my head. I think that's the most un- underrated nursery rhyme, uh, underappreciated. What's your favorite nursery rhyme? Um, I, you know, I, I remember growing up on some, what was it? Mother grammar, Grimm's Grimm's tales. I don't even, I don't even remember, man. I had a book when I was a kid, but uh, yeah, I don't know that I have one. I didn't do a ton of nursery rhymes with my kids. We did just a lot of, a lot of free form stories. And then a couple of, a couple of like recurring songs we'd sing every go. night, but yeah, it's fun to be able to create that, that um, what's the word tradition, I guess like that, that default. I was talking, it was weird. I was talking with my wife this morning about, the defaults in both of our lives in relation to food. You ever think about that? Uh, like what certain preferences that you have or she has? Yeah. But like the, we're very much conditioned based on how you grew up, the messages you were told about food, what was good to eat, bad to eat, healthy or not. Like I, I was thinking about what we were talking about one friend in particular, a family that we both know they're super healthy. They're really into fitness and it's in large part, as far as I can see, because the parents were just like, really valued those things and led through leadership as opposed to in other scenarios where it's like purely didactic and you're told what to do, but it's not necessarily modeled. Yeah. I mean, I know we're our own people, but I was telling a friend of mine on it. So I got this text thread with me and my five of my high school buddies. Nice. It's like degraded into just like political mudslinging nonstop between oh, wow. the far left and the far right. <laughs> and it's like, it's actually like we need to call a meeting about it. It's, it's actually becoming an issue. But uh, <clears throat> but I, I sent something recently. It was like, hey, before you get all bent about your beliefs, realize that probably 90% of it has to do with the fact that you just happen to be born into the family you're born into. Like, you know what I mean? Like your dad happens to be <laughs> far left and so is your mom. And yeah. this person's dad happens to be conservative. My dad happens to be conservative. You know what I mean? And so, yeah, there's definitely anomalies there, but, uh, you know, before you get all entrenched in your position, it's probably due to conditioning. Yeah. Well, that's why it's always good to think about like what's actually producing results for you. What beliefs are producing the results that give you joy? I find that to be, for the most part, I find that to be a pretty good heuristic that seems to like cut across all the noise of inherited versus chosen beliefs. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, which ones do you choose? I think, you know, I'm really fascinated with our job as leaders really being to really master, become a master of the mind and of our emotions. Mm. That's finding beliefs that, uh, you know, we, we think are going to propel us forward. But, Mm -hmm. um, you know, I heard Dan Sullivan say something recently, like, 
the reason small businesses stay small is because they've never given up doing the hows. And I would take it a step further, like never given up figuring out the hows. Like we talk about who, not how. And we've also talked about that question, which I've been given more thought about the last week or two about, you know, what if Elon Musk came in and, and took over mm-hmm. Warren Buffett? What would they do? I'm pretty sure the first thing they wouldn't do is try to figure out like property management, like, <laughs> like hacks, you know what I mean? Or like, what's like, I mean, they'd probably maybe read like a quick book or like something about just some basics and then they would hire people. Like, I think I, it was a quote I heard or something that you don't build a business, you hire people and then they build the business or something like that. I'm really fascinated around that yeah. and going more deep with that. Cause I think that I, is what separates you know, the business, the big ones from the small ones, so to speak. You know, my number one takeaway from that question, Steve, what Elon Musk would do or, or Jeff Bezos would do, it, they'd shut it down, bro. Like they'd, they'd shut it down and move on and go do something else, <laughs> which it speaks to me in the level of creating optionality in my life, in my business. And I think about this in relation to employees too. Like my advice for hiring salespeople is to hire two so that you immediately have some comparison and a point of reference. When you have a second business, you have more than one opportunity. You can start to actually relate to them rationally because your entire identity as an entrepreneur isn't wrapped up in the one. You know, you can go from one to two, from two to three. It, there's a lot of freedom and optionality. Yeah, that's interesting. And I actually think that's great advice. But I would say it's usually good to build a foundation with a base business first. I True. Think, right. True. But once you kind of have a base business, um, then I think, yeah, that makes a lot more sense. But, you know, it can work both ways. But like what, what describe a base business for me, man, like in your scenario, like you've, I think you've graduated beyond base business, you know, like you're not trying to keep food on your table right now. Yeah. I mean, basically, I guess it would just be something that's throwing off enough cash flow and um, kind of running itself, I guess. Like, it's yeah. Like- require you to, uh, that would be a good test. That was something I always dreamed of. And it's funny when dreams come true, sometimes we've just passed them by, but like, yeah, it was always sexy to me was to be able to go on business, go on a trip and have the business grow. I used to say it in a morning affirmation every morning. It was like part, I had this like affirmation I said for like two, three years. And that was part of it was, uh, my business runs better when I'm gone than when I'm here. Um, I think that's a big part of it, but, um, but yeah. So, so, so I, talking about that, like when, do, when do you ever reach that goal? There's something about that goal that seems off to me in the sense that it feels like if you're waiting for, if you're waiting to get there, then you're never going to get there. Cause there's always going to be optimizations and improvements and you're constantly going to be breaking it because of your aspiration. It's almost like, you get to 80% and you call it done and like you hop over. When I think about the adventures that I've had starting other businesses, I, it has very much come at the expense, or at least I've had to factor in the cost of a certain level of dereliction on other businesses and just be okay with that rather than getting to the point where everything was like perfect. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think it's different for everyone. And it's like portfolio versus departmental to bring it down to like the PM. There you go. Level Where it's different for everyone. And I think it comes down to just what's motivating and fascinating, you know? Agreed. If, if you can stay motivated and fascinated in, in property management or whatever business you're in and go 30, 40 years deep, that's awesome. Build an incredible business. That's great. Um, I heard Naveen Jain, this entrepreneur that's like claims he's going to be the first person to go to the moon. Uh, he's kind of a forward thinker, <laughs> but he says, uh, once you become an expert in a business, in an industry, you have very little to give. Like, mm. like so yeah. he, when I heard him say that, I, I didn't agree with that. Or, I mean, I, I was like, yeah, but you know, I don't know. I don't, I don't necessarily resonate, but now, now it sits more, um, more true with me, I think. Here's the sense in which it resonates with me is when you become bored, the things that used to fascinate you and light you up are now boring minutiae because you've already mastered it. There's no newness, no freshness. There's no, you're not putting your ass on the line. The risk and the unknown is part of what drives an entrepreneur. And when everything exists within the realm of certainty, you, you got to go seek it somewhere else. Yeah. And so like in my business, I want to get out of the way. 
of my team in a lot of regards that are running the operations that are making the operations better that are you know growing it and so there's been other verticals um or other areas in uh, management in real estate i should say that are interesting to me so like we're doing the own biggest client um vlog about going to kansas city and buying property and trying to you know grow in other markets and become our own biggest client uh we're doing like an accessory dwelling unit series about like the in california to try to help the housing crisis they're letting they're easing restrictions so most people can build like a second unit on their land which is like really exciting Mm -hmm. um so we're doing that uh you know we're doing a lot of um just a lot of content around you know different things that to keep to keep people motivated and fascinated and um and making sure the team stays motivated and fascinated that's really how we started OBC, it really got started with um, Bryce, one of our leasing managers was like really interested in real in uh, real estate investing. And it kind of got me kicked into like, oh yeah, you know, I, I want to get back in the game. I kind of lost focus. And then, so I think it's also looking at your team too and seeing if there's things that, you know, keep them fired up and lit up, you know? Dude, I love that. That turns me on so much. I feel like a lot of times when you talk about employees, it's a conversation centered around what we're going to get from them. And then on occasion, we reach up and have a more enlightened moment or it's like, oh, what can I give to? But in many ways, the what can I give is like pretty quickly comes back to what can I get? If you think about the heuristic of like this virtuous circle, for me, it's about creating it's about getting engagement engagement is what i want engagement from smart talented people will result in the business value production that's gonna that's gonna grow the business but in order to get the engagement you have to have buy-in fascination meaning all of these things for me come back to like leaning into the creative side of the business i've been doing that recently with the rent scale crew i mentioned to you doing um, just various videos and events and just having a ton of fun, which think about this, man, can you have a ton of fun if you actually don't like like a fair number of people in your staff? Like if, you, you're just not going to have fun if you don't like someone, you know, if you don't enjoy working with somebody, there's no fun to be had. Right. I know literally uh, everyone must like each other <laughs> in my business. It like makes me uncomfortable. So that, that's probably not the right way to get, to lead though. But, uh, but no, like make when, when someone has a problem with someone, I like pull them both in the room. I'm like, all right, let's talk it out. Like I, I, I literally can't sleep at night if I know one person harbors like resentment towards another person, just cause I know that that's like a cancer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, people that need to be able to hang out together and people choosing to hang out together in a social setting is a really good sign. There's actually some, some juice and some mojo going there. One of the best pieces of advice I got recently was from uh, Clint Ford did that article on the Harvard Business Review for Netflix, their their culture document or whatever that went viral. Mm-hmm. I, right. I was late to the party on that one, but Same uh, here. <laughs> but uh, the number one thing they said was, "How do we keep A players? You only keep A players, or something like that. Like, how do you retain A players? Is like you make sure you only surround them with other other A players." And I really thought that was interesting because as we grow, a lot of us generally over time, at at some point, we'll get one, maybe two people that aren't quite, but we're keeping them around because, you know, it's kind of, we don't want to deal with it, but that's actually going to drive your A players off the field, you know? Mm, Bro, so well said. I've been thinking recently about how across this group of business partners that I work with, they call different things out of me and they have different forms of expertise. The relationships that are most enjoying to me are when somebody affirms and feeds my impulses and like my, my desires of where I want to go in my career, but I'm holding back. Like in the creative aspect, for example, like in my head, I'm like, Oh, I got this creative idea. But then it's like, Oh, well, you know, is that practical? Are we going to really, but when somebody else, when you speak it and somebody else is like, Oh, that's dope. Like, let's actually put like word to action. That's so, so big for me, man. The conversation that you and I have been able to stand about mindfulness and thinking about business as like, just in an integrated holistic way as, as like a subset of the bigger life that you want, that, that calls things out of me that otherwise I would, I would keep silent. And I think that's what you need with 
team members or at least people in leadership. Like, yeah, you're going to lead them, but there's a sense in which they should be leading you towards the things that you mutually want. Yeah. And it's funny, we were talking the other day about, I think it was at our level 10 about, you know, the whole approach about like at, at Tribe, we spend a lot of time on mindset stuff. Mm-hmm. And, um, and we just had a call on, you know, open forum just on, you know, ask and give and property management things. And it was actually super valuable. So there's both, but <clears throat> you know, the mindset stuff, like if I was hearing three or four years ago, like Jordan talking about mindfulness and Steve talking about this, I, you know, I don't know how interested I would be like, <laughs> you know, um, I had to kind of graduate to this level. Cause I remember when I heard Jason Goldberg first speak about being versus doing, I was like, not interested in the being like, what do you, okay. Mm-hmm. So what do you got on the doing part? Like, what, <laughs> what here, bro? like what, all right, hippie. Like, I'm trying to get paid son. <laughs> shoot off, you know? Right. But, uh, <clears throat> but I've realized over time that um, I want to grow a bigger bit, a big business, you know, like a successful business, not, not necessarily big, but like successful. And that requires leadership more than anything leadership mm-hmm. every issue like the three mm. biggest issues that we come across how to build a high performance team I, I would say growing um you know growing your company and let's say client experience we've surveyed a lot of managers those are kind of the three like big areas that most people have issues with those all can be traced back to leadership issues like um becoming a master of your mind and emotions um, it's a big part of that. And so when your job becomes, how do I level up myself to become the best leader possible, to become a master of my mind and emotions, to be, to elevate my mindset, cause your business and your mindset will always be at an equilibrium. Mm. And then you're able to just think at a different level, hire the, the who's that can actually build your company versus staying in the house your whole, your whole life and trying to figure out how to make this work. That's what's really interesting to me. And that's where I'm playing in, you know? Mm, whoever's editing this please put a church choir and a church organ behind what steve said for the last two minutes <laughs> i'm so with you bro leadership it's the only thing to be solving for not the how <laughs> right leadership is is all that exists so let's talk about that we're something really tactical at the end of the tribe call we're like 10 minutes over and somebody's like hey can i have like one more ask and they're, it's like somehow it led into content and i was like all right that's like a, a multi-hour Call. Let's talk about content, not as. So, where does content start? Content's like, I need more leads. Oh, content marketing. Oh, Lord, please help me now. But, you know, I'll do some video blogs, et cetera. And it's just like this sad state. And then it graduates. And at some point, you realize that content is actually the vehicle. It's a vehicle to communicate your core values, to engage in the creative act in order to just like talk about what you're about and to attract more people like that and to like express myself in a way that's really fulfilling. I think that's where you and I are at with it, but we can still make it really complicated. I got to hire, like the first response that came up was like, well, I don't know if I have the money to hire somebody full time, et cetera. The stuff I've been doing recently is hire a film crew, bring them in. Last time it was like half day within a half day, we created a bunch of videos. It was really high impact. It was premeditated, scripted. My staff, like non-professional content people just leaned in and we got a ton of stuff done. That's one way to do it. I don't, I think you're doing something different. What are you doing? What's working? What's not doing? Like, how is it feeding joy? Yeah. So I think you made a lot of good points there. The content strategy also is to build relationships. So that's another yes big reason. It's also to get clear on what you believe. You know, when you're forced to think about what you believe, where, where you stand on certain issues, and then disseminate it to the world in, in a mm. teachable format. Uh, there's some things I said a while ago where I'm like, yeah, I don't necessarily believe that anymore. Let's do a re- reboot on that. But, but uh, so... <clears throat> It's art, more of an art than a science. And I I mentioned that I've started to come full circle from where Marcus Sheridan first said at PM Grow one, that we're all media companies. I was like, yeah, I don't know if that's necessarily true, but yeah, maybe some companies, but not us. But the more I've, I've dived into content, the more I realized that we really are media companies. Like, um, at least if there's different ways to grow and make it work, but with all the opportunities with Facebook and email marketing and Instagram and just all of these cheap avenues to get your word out there and the ability to send one-to-one videos, just the person that can disseminate their message more clearly, have a cleared message and um, humanize their, their offering, I guess, 
um, is going to win. And so there's a reason why Gary V, I think, is a very smart, forward thinking guy. Uh, it, he, he said he was recently at a can festival or something. He's like the coolest, the thing I'm most proud of, honestly, is that out of all these creators here, thousands of creators, I still create more content than anybody at this event. <laughs> he's like, <laughs> he's like, I come up, create 40 to 60 pieces of content a day. And I'm the CEO of the company. Like I'm not even the, you know what I mean? Like the content guy or whatever. Wow. So, um, he's obviously on to something he knows because he's all about attention. He's all about undervalued attention. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, getting Facebook ads, getting your face seen, getting LinkedIn ads, uh, boosting LinkedIn posts for, for, for cheap money. Um, now do I, can I disseminate on a board? Like exactly all the funnels we're dropping people into and how they come out at the end as a contact and the ROI. Mm. Right. I, yeah, I could give you some basics, you know, if we sat with Olivia, because she knows more about that than me. But sure. I'm looking at the P&L. I'm looking at the uh, the lead flow and and uh, and it's working after a full year of doing it. Like we're going deeper. That's why we're doing all these vlog series and things. So big believer in content. The, the more the content, more content, the better. Yeah, man. I would just like reemphasize, you know, with my proper coach background, et cetera, like I'm all about the ROI, et cetera. But what net, what doesn't get fit in the ROI, I think it was Gary, Gary that I heard say, what's the ROI of putting your pants on in the morning? <laughs> like, how do you quantify that? You know, seems important, <laughs> but I don't know how you do the math on that. So what is the ROI on getting clear on what you're about in communicating that to your staff? And in reminding yourself, being straightforward with customers and in having having fun. Like when I think about that video shoot that we recently did where we landed in Nashville, we went directly to a costume store. We picked out costumes for like an hour. Everybody was so lit up, having so much fun, uh, putting on some earth, wind and fire and just rocking out in front of a camera like uh, it's hard for me to fully quantify that. I, there was massive value. I haven't even sent out the video yet, but there's already been like massive value for my team created. You feel me? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, if it if it fires you up as an owner and you're into content, um, it's definitely somewhere to be spending time and investing in because I believe in it. If you don't, I would, like you said, I think you gave a great piece of advice. Uh, I think the question was like, what would you do over starting a new business? One of the tribe members is kind of like restarting, yeah, restarting a business in a sense. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you said hire a creative. And I thought that was brilliant because, uh, I've seen other shops, property management shops in particular, that the, the founder maybe wasn't like the big, the creative, but hired a creative, like a really smart, young person that knows Instagram, knows YouTube, knows, you know, video marketing, knows how to tell stories, which is, you know, what people, um, you know, want to see. And they've, uh, they've all these companies that I've been following, they're just growing, they're growing big time. And and it comes down to not just uh, the SEO, like that's, that's where I was, my head was at when I was doing videos, like, okay, yeah. well, this video ranking, you know, is it getting on page one? But it's, it's about the conversion too. It's about, um, when people see it, do they build, do they go deeper with you from a relationship standpoint and move further down the funnel to become a customer? Yeah. Let's, let's do some shout outs, man. I know what's probably top of mind for you is Andrew working for Matt and Lexi out in Austin. Yeah. I love Trey Holmes is doing a great job. They, they have Andrew, who's a very creative guy who I don't think did any property management. Um, and, uh, they've been, they've been really doing good. I know, I know Brad Larson was one of the first people kind of shooting videos at scale. And I would, I would guess that's probably one of the big reasons he was able to grow maybe at least early on. I don't know how many videos he's still doing, but, um, we've grown a lot from video and content. So I know it works for us. Um, yeah, there's, there's just a lot of examples out there. Um, so Courtney working for Russ Vandator and Kevin working for Pete and Steve out of Houston. It's not broad. There's not a ton of people doing it, but there is definitely a handful and it is producing results. And it really is about cultural orientation. Is it important to you to have creativity, creative expression, <clears throat> communication of your values, and to have a brand, man, a brand, property management is not a brand. What you do and how you do it is not a brand. A yeah. brand is 
an identity, a perception of beliefs and values that is bigger than and transcends what you do. And most companies, the vast majority of small businesses have, have very little forethought put into that. Yeah. I mean, we're all communication companies. What I'm fired up right now, like I'm, <clears throat> I've got some irons in the fire. I've lit up life, which is kind of like a, a vlog about um, that kind of encompasses everything like my music, uh, the tribe, good life. Um, I'll put a link in the show notes, but uh, the OBC LLC one. So we, we, I, we released our first two episodes. I had two of my uh, employees go out to Kansas city and we're the whole premise of the show is like, Hey, we want to invest out of state. We want it because for cash flow, we can't get it in California really right now. Um, and we're not ex we're not experts at doing this. We've in fact we've never done it. And so we're gonna take you along the journey and we're gonna mess up and um, you know, we're gonna have some wins and you're gonna learn with us. And so we posted its first two episodes out. Within a day, we get our first lead. Hi, I follow I saw your video. I wanna invest 150000 in BRRRR strategy, which is like buy Burr, yeah. Yeah, burr, yeah. Um, and I love, I love your, uh, your content. Um, well done. Give me a call. And I'm like, holy crap. Amazing. I'm like that. If I was in, well, I'm going to be in one of those markets hopefully soon, but if I was in one of those markets, like I, I'm even thinking maybe I go really who not how I wanted to ask your opinion. Jordan is like, rather than go out and try to f- figure out the wholesaling game in some market and then figure out how to acquire the properties and then figure out how to like rehab them just bringing my capability of content creation and matching it up with somebody that already knows how to do all that stuff and say, Hey, I'll I'll bring a bunch of leads from all over the country to you Mm -hmm. because man, who doesn't want to buy a hundred thousand dollar house that throws off 200 bucks a month? Uh, You know what I mean? Like there's a lot of people that want to do that. You know what I mean? And so, yeah, um, it's interesting. Here, Here are my thoughts, man. So I saw Harry Heist, talking trash about Grant Cardone on Facebook. And I bring that up because his criticism was like, Hey guys like Grant Cardone or some of these other sales guys, uh, Ty Lopez, all of a sudden get into real estate and they're let's be honest, like they're making money. They're actually raising large funds, deploying capital, et cetera. So I'm leery of criticizing any successful entrepreneur because like you can't, criticize the hustle. If somebody's making money, they're making money. But I get the sentiment of what Harry is saying. And I would translate it as this. Why is a internet marketing star the one that is aggressively doing syndications and raising money as opposed to people like you, people that are in property management and are this close to it? You know, like why is our industry at a whole been so slow to get on the bandwagon with syndications and to actually make that have we talk about and en- enabling the investor client. We talk about feeding the full kind of life cycle of client needs as opposed to just handling management, but there's been so much lag. So I'm super turned on by this thought. And I don't see any reason why you can't chunk out the value chain and work with a couple of partners that work with multiple wholesalers, multiple people at, and various pieces of the, of the puzzle. And as long as you're not dependent, the beauty about it is like on a transaction by transaction basis, you can find out what works, what doesn't find a couple of good partners after working through some bad ones. And then eventually take over more, more of it and do it yourself as it makes that. sense. So glad you brought that up. I put a star next to it because it's like one of those bucket list things. It's one of those things I always wanted to do. And I'll tell you the reason why I don't do it. And it's the reason probably 90% of everyone else doesn't do it is because how do you do it? how the how monster (laughs) reappears yeah it's like how do you like oh like i bought this apartment syndication book and i just gave it away like i never even opened it because i'm like i don't even want to know how now like why did i like if i do it i need i i don't want to figure out the how (laughs) you know i gotta but you know there's ron there's people in tribe there's other people uh you know out there that uh i think if we can put together the right team and use the right capability, uh, match the right capabilities, that's, that's the golden formula. Mm. Yeah, man. There are people out there. There are hustlers. So go back to Matt and Lexi tree homes in Austin. Matt is an animal. He's a hustler. He's doing a lot of, a lot of transactions. Like I, I love just that personality profile of the bird dogger, the guy that's out there just has like that real estate bug, you know, and they're, they're playing the arbitrage game, finding undervalued, deals, et cetera. There's something about that personality type. That's just like really fun to interact with. Yeah. Yeah. There's some people doing, uh, 
doing good vlogs on like wholesaling and, and bird dogging and all that stuff. Um, less people, I thought about it the other day. I'm like, what if I had a full-time videographer just like uh, shooting property management and like the day-to-day stuff that would probably do well in the property management space among managers. Um, you know, I don't know. There's just so many stories to tell. So like my mind, my mind's so like true. racing now. Like I want to like tell all these different stories because, um, people are hungry for, for just real, um, people putting themselves out there, number one, and number two, if they can get some value from it and build a relationship with people. It's, it's a super fun time right now to be a creator. Ah, uh, dude, I agree. What blows my mind is what I like, you're not talking about radically altering your life for the purposes of like recording things. You're basically just talking about like telling stories, well-crafted stories about what's already happening in your life. That's what kind of blows my mind. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And and I'm finding the balance right now. I'm, I'm kind of seeing what this whole vlog world's about, but, uh, but it's a fun, it's a fun journey. And um, I got matched up with uh, a guy, Patrick's been helping me on the editing and on the kind of creating the ideas and the structure for, for the episodes. And it's so much better doing it with someone else uh, because just the idea flow, the co-creation, it, it's, it's, it's so important. And I, I, like I've said before, I think I'm never trying just to sit in here and do things by myself anymore. It's like, I should always be at least checking my work with somebody else. So you're going to drop the link in the show notes, but I really want people to see this because I'm really digging what you're doing. Like, is there something, if if they can't find it in the show notes, like what can somebody Google or type in on YouTube to find the vlog series? Uh, Steve Welty Music, if if you type that in YouTube. And then uh, I think it's pinned at the top of my my YouTube channel for music. So, Okay. So you, you're tying it to your music channel presence? Like, yeah. Okay. Yeah. In fact, uh, he asked, he's like, do you want to put like, tie this into good life. And I'm like, I have to think about that. Like, I don't mind, like I'd like, if clients saw it, if prospective clients saw it, that would be great. I, I don't necessarily mind, but I'm like, I'm still hesitant to like throw it front and center because I feel like it's based around music and then things are like music is the hub kind of. And then it's periphery. Everything else is kind of on the outskirts, but, um, but yeah, maybe I, what do you think? Should I just throw it up on good life or what? <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know what the flavor of the focus is going to be going forward. I heard a lot of focus on, on business. So I don't know. It's a blend. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see. We'll see. But, uh, but no, it's good to, um, it's good to rinse and repeat. Like it's funny on the tribe call yesterday, I was talking with Bob and it's so funny how sometimes you have to hear the same thing multiple times before you find it back and like, and, and so I told, I told the tribe, I'm like, all right, can we have a cultural just agreement, like bring in some, some terminology where if someone says, Hey, push the button, then it just means you do it. It means like, I know this is going to work so well for you that you don't need to think about it anymore. I'm making the decision for you. Push the button. Like, mm. like, that's a high bar. So I don't want to, I don't use it lightly, but if I ever tell anyone to push the button, it means like if EOS, someone's like, oh, like, who, tell me about EOS. I'm like, just push the button, like email this guy and uh, read this book and start it ASAP. You know what I mean? So if you're listening to this right now, now would be a good time to wind down the podcast and ask yourself, what have you been resisting? What do you, what changes do you need to make? What have you been tolerating in your life? And what do you just need to push the freaking button on? Yeah. With, with that. It was good uh, good ch- chatting with you, Steve. Let's go ahead and wind down and uh, let's all go push the button. Right on, man. Push it. Hey, Tribe Nation, please, 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 if you've gotten value from this episode or any other episodes, hit the subscribe button. I know a lot of people aren't subscribed. Uh, so please hit the subscribe as well as share an episode. If you've enjoyed this episode or other episodes, please share it with someone who you think could get value from it. We're trying to make an impact and spread the word. So your help is much needed and appreciated. Thank you. Did you enjoy this episode? Please share it with a friend and leave a review on iTunes. If you'd like to find out more about joining the tribe, go to tribemastermind.com to understand why the best and brightest mastermind with us. 